the title of our message, Know the Mighty Lord, taken from Joshua chapter 4 and verses 1 to 24. Gratefulness is one of the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. Remembrance is the hallmark of gratitude. What is gratefulness in the Institute of Basic Life Principles? It's given to us this definition. It says, making known to God and others what, in what ways they have benefited our lives. Gratefulness is opposed to unthankfulness. What would happen if no one ever taught us how to read instructions, how to look at road signs, how to read the Bible? How long would, can we live if we, were, if we never receive food? What would we do if no one provided a roof over our head? Even the very breath of our nostrils come from the Almighty God. And this gives and all that we have received out of the good hand of God and out of those who have blessed us by the mercy of God behooves us that we would be a thankful people. An unthankful person does not notice how much others have done for him. He forgets to say thank you, but rather has the attitude that he deserves certain benefits and favour. He might even murmur and show displeasure at the acts of kindness toward him if it is not done to his satisfaction because he's self-centred, he's unable to see the efforts of others, how he is blessed by them. The one who is ungrateful misses the opportunity to encourage those around him with a contented attitude, with a cheerful countenance, and with verbal appreciation of their efforts. Israel was living in momentous times where God would bring them into the, the land of promise that he has given to them by faith and the people of God are to claim them. Here we would notice how the people of Israel they were moved by God to inherit the land. And this scene of the inheriting of the land brings before us the scene of God's mighty power in enacting deliverance for his people. We have three thoughts that we bring before you experientially or evidentially. When we walk with God and the power of God flows through us, we see God's guidance, God's power in our lives. We have just passed lived the past week and how many of us have a testimony to share of what God had done for us in answer to prayer in the least of our endeavours experientially 
the Lord wants us to see what He is doing in our lives and the evidence of what He is doing. The Lord seeks that we would not forget. We say remembrance is the hallmark of gratitude. That's the second thought. How Israel is to, well, I coined the word memorically, to remember what God had done for us, the good things that we have received, how He builds us up in our faith by His great care in leading and guiding us moment by moment, day by day. And memorially, so that we would not forget, Israel is instructed to make marks, signs, so that they would be able to be jotted in their memory what God had done for them. For if they would not remember, well, you would see in the history of Israel how the memorials faded to oblivion as the generations pass. What is the reason why the people of God is so forgetful and soon they thought that life was good because of what they are, who they are, is of their own strength that they live their lives. And for the people of God, if we have experienced God in our lives, His power and acted, flowing in and through us, well, we must jot down, remember. There are those of us who write diaries and we put down what God had done for us. We have prayed and this is our answered prayer. I remember for a time, we have a family book, Bible prayer book. So we would put down the prayer items that we have. And over time, we would see the answered prayers of what God had done for us. And those records, as the years pass, seek to help us to see memorically, memorially what God had done. That indeed He is a living and true God. And then the third thought, that we would declare, testify of Him in our lives. The first thought, evidentially or experientially. The people of Israel, beginning with Joshua, was in one accord obeying the direction of the Lord. You notice in our text, there are three verses in which is recorded for us the phrase, the Lord speak. The Lord spoke. He gave the instruction. And the people of God obeyed. The people of God followed. They hear the voice of God showing the way for them and they were obedient to the voice of God speaking to them and they listened and they followed. Verse 1, verse 10, verse 15. The Lord spoke. Unless the Lord had spoken, they moved not. But when the Lord had spoken, they obeyed and acted according to the directive of the Lord. 
This is the privilege of life with God. He directs our steps. And the ways of God, the psalmist testify for us, is perfect. Turn with me to Psalm 18, verse 30. Psalm 18, verse 30. It says here, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in Him. God's way is perfect. The word there means complete, entire. It's the way of integrity, the way of truth, the unblemished way, the undefiled way, the upright and the wholesome way. The Lord leads us. And the psalmist says that he's a buckler, he's a shield to all those that trust in him. The word trust is a very important word in the vocabulary of the people of God. The word trust comes from the root word that means to lie face down to the ground. To lie face down to the ground. A picture of total helplessness. One who is being cast down and has nothing to stand upon. As it were, the ground has gone out underneath him. He has no visible means of support. And that's the place where oftentimes God brings us to, to trust Him. And I received a letter this week of someone who we mentioned two weeks ago was to be evicted from the house and without a job. And so what do you do? Well, we say trust in the Lord. And so this week I received another message. They were evicted from the house, managed to get a place to stay, looking for a job. And then suddenly a letter came to them. An envelope I was shown with a picture. And there, there were those who were concerned making provisions for them. And the interesting thing is that the letter came without postage. But the postal office nonetheless sent it to her. And so she received it together with her two daughters who were so thankful to the Lord that the Lord helped them in their time of need. That's the meaning of the word trust there. It describes ones who is put in a position with no physical means of support, that all we have is God. And this is the reality of a matter of fact of life, which the Lord, in His creating the nation of Israel, brings that picture of dependence before us. That He is the one who created all things and that He seeks that we would follow Him, enjoy His presence, His power, His provision in our lives, the blessed communion that we have. So, in many situations, our, sit, our life may look hopeless, but here it is where the Lord would show Himself powerful in our lives. This is where God placed Israel at the brink of the overflowing Jordan River. 
they have reached an impasse at the Jordan River and God has led them to the brink and they had to learn to trust Him to lead them across. Dear friends, this is life with God, a supernatural life. God's power flow in and through us for His glory. Moses says to the people of Israel, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. The Lord will lead His people. His way is perfect. We had our church camp in June and the topic of our church camp taken from Romans 12, verse 1 to 2, you remember? The renewing of the mind. How we need our minds to be renewed so that we would forsake the world, not be conformed to it, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You recall how the Lord led Philip, the evangelist, one of the deacons of the early church, to bring the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch, the first African convert, the first, God's first missionary to the African continent. You turn with me to Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. The account of how the Lord led Philip to evangelize to the Ethiopian eunuch. Verse 26 says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and there he saw a man. He was asked to go to the wilderness, a place where no one is. And there, lo and behold, there will be a man whom God has instructed that he will minister to. And our text tells us further on in, a, in verse Twenty-nine. The Spirit would again say to Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. The Lord leads us by His Spirit according to His Word. And this was what Philip did. He came forth listening to the voice of God speaking to him through, his, through the Spirit of God. And there he ministered to this eunuch from Ethiopia. And that's where the gospel first entered the African continent. The Spirit of God leading and guiding us, showing us the perfect way by which we ought to go. He leads us, and we know it. Paul says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which men's wisdom speak, teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Word of God the Spirit of God used to guide us in our life. We are going to print soon the Bible without 
chapter and verses. A spiritual endeavor so that we would take time to read the Word of God. You would require more focus and the Lord would require us to go through and in the market today, you don't see it. Well, we have seen some copies where uh, they would divide into paragraphs for us. But no, without chapters and verses, as it was originally given to us, I believe it would help us to search the scripture with more focus and by the Spirit of God would teach us, guide us, as we search the scripture more diligently to know the will of God to guide us, the Lord will show the way, experientially guide us. Isn't it so wonderful? Daily, as you come to the Lord, you seek Him, He instructs you. Do you have a Beginning, begin a day where you have certain burdens in your heart and you don't know how to solve them. But as you open the Word of God and you open to the devotions that the Lord brought to you and every time it's spot on, He gives you an answer. He provides you the solution. Well, that's my experience. Humbly, the Lord does show the way. And we feel so comforted that we are not on our own. You see, I remember the time before coming to the Lord where you have no reliance upon anything divine as in the Word of God to guide us. And so, somehow, you realize that life just doesn't click. Is it this way or that way? Don't know. Cannot tell. But after knowing God, after being given the scriptures, that's where the Lord guides us. And that's where we are instructed. At. And experientially, we see God in our lives. Turn with me to Ephesians 3, verses 9 to 12. Ephesians 3, verse 9 to 12. The Apostle Paul describes for us that life of the believer. He says this, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and the powers in heavenly places might be made known, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Heavenly wisdom given to us that you may be able to see through a matter, see through the things that confronts us, so Paul writes, to the intent now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. God reveals to us his wisdom according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. God plants that faith in our hearts and guides us in the heavenly way so that we have bonus and access to Christ, the fountain of all wisdom. Israel experienced the guidance of God this is a new generation. 
at every command of God, when God speak, they were there to listen. They were listening intensely. And they acted. So verse 1 of our text says, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean past over Jordan, that the Lord speak unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them that take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priests stood firm, twelve stones that ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging where ye shall lodge this night. The Lord spoke. The Lord has wrought a great miracle to enable them to cross the Jordan. And the Lord wanted them not to forget what He had done for them. And so the Lord speak to them so that their faith would continually be kindled to obedience and in discipleship to follow the Lord. Verse 10, the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people. When the Lord speak, the people listened according to all that Moses commanded Joshua and the people hasted and passed over. They crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. And verse 15, And the Lord commanded Joshua that command the priests that bear the ark that they come out of the Jordan. You see, the priest has been standing there. They were the first to step into the Jordan. And after they stepped into the Jordan, suddenly the waters dried up. And then they were to bear the ark there while the people began to cross. So you can imagine Joshua asking the people, quick, move, move. And you see the the, the river opening up, drying up, and there you would also see the hard ground whereby they are to walk, maybe still muddy, full of rocks. It's not an easy path for them. Perhaps they would have to go down slope because of the river bed that, that is uh, deep, and then they have to walk, and then they have to go up slope again. So it's uh, quite a journey for two million people to cross. And this was what the Lord did. And the, the priests were holding the ark. And while they held the ark and stood firm there, the waters were stopped. And the land was dry. And they crossed. It was a great deliverance that the Lord wrought for them. And in the midst of it, the Lord gave the command to them to pick up 12 stones. 12 stones from the bed of Jordan out of the place where the priest's feet stood, verse 3 tells us, which they would use as a memorial unto future generations. So they were to pick up 12 stones and then in addition they were to set up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan. So two process, two commands there in verse 3 and in verse 9. Verse 3. And command ye them saying take you hence out of the midst of Jordan out of the place where the priest stood firm, twelve stones. And ye shall carry them over you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. And verse 9, And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan 
in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the ark of the covenant stood. And they were there unto this day. When they were at the Red Sea, the Lord did not instruct them to leave 12 stones in the riverbed. The Lord did not instruct them to take 12 stones to bring it to the other side. But Pharaoh and all his army that came chasing after the Israelites, they all sank into the bottom. Exodus 15 verse 5 says, as a stone. That was the the memorial that the Lord left. The carcasses, the demise of the enemy. But here when they crossed the Jordan, the Lord instructed them there were no enemies chasing them. The Lord would just part the river. Of course, the enemy is right ahead of them in Jericho. The Lord instructed them to pick up the 12 stones and to lay it there as a sign of the victory that, thou, that God has given to them. Verse 6 of our text says that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to pass, saying, What mean ye these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it passed over Jordan. And the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. The Lord instructed them not to forget what God had done for them. Because when they began to possess the land, when they began to plant their vineyards, when the olive trees began to grow, and the Lord would send the rain, and they would have their lush produce, it would be easy for them to forget what the Lord had done to deliver them to inherit the land of promise that God had given to them. The power of the Lord in His deliverance. Dear friends, today we don't know, we can't see what God is doing to protect us each day. Uh, we were just uh, nearby and you know, we were about to open the door of the car and before we opened a, a motorcycle sped past. We were able to open the door just after the motorcycle sped past. Many instances in our lives God is doing miraculous, marvelous, supernatural work to protect us. Uh, we won't know it now, but the day when we will meet the Lord, He would show us what He had done for us to bring us through this earthly pilgrimage. Dear friends, Israel was instructed to remember the crossing of the Jordan River. And Jordan, the word Jordan itself is interesting. It comes from the word itself that signifies jaw, which means spread, and den, den which means judging or to judge. The Jordan River, as it were, was a place of judgment. 
that indeed it showed how they were able to pass through. It was to be, well, overflowing, and that if they would cross, they would all die there. But God delivered them and make them pass through safely so that they would come across delivered, as it were, from death to resurrection. When our Lord Jesus Christ was upon earth, there He came to the Jordan River. And at the Jordan River, He was baptized. And there, John the baptizer preached, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, the word repent means to judge yourself. Realize that you, you're in trouble, you need help. The crossing of the Jordan from death unto life is a picture that brings for us what God had done to cross the Jordan divide from death to eternal life. The day when we take our last breath, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The crossing of the Jordan, a momentous event. The Lord doesn't want us to forget those things that He had done for us, how He opened our spiritual eyes to come to know Him. And from that time on, isn't it, all of us can testify, life is different. We know by the grace of God the perfect way to live. We have the Word of God and the Spirit of God to guide us, to show us where to go, what to do, how privileged we are. The difference, death unto life. Verse 10 of our text says, For the priest which bare the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people. The priest tarried there holding the ark until all crossed over. They were there until it is finished. It was finished. They have completed the journey into the promised land. Our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross endured, as it were, was holding upon Him the sins of you and I until it was recorded in the Scriptures. He says, I thirst. John 19 Verse 28 and 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. What was that transition? It is finished. They have finished that until everything was finished, that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over. You see, they were seeking to pass the, the, the Jordan River 40 years, you know. They never did cross. And the old generation died in the wilderness. But now, the Lord is leading them across and they have crossed. It is finished. The Lord Jesus Christ, 
bore our sins to remind us that the justice of God that was demanded was all fulfilled, all paid in full by Christ. And Christ was baptized in the Jordan River, as it were, in death, and then to rise again in victory. The Lord wants us to see and understand what He is doing for us. And He provided the sign to Israel. What was the sign? The sign of the 12 stones that each of the tribe of Israel must bring out of the Jordan, hold it on their shoulder. In other words, it's a big stone. Right? And God had already appointed the men. Right? In chapter 3, we, we read of it. Right? The man has been appointed that would pick up the stone and then they would place it finally when they cross at this place called Gilgal that is halfway between the Jordan River and the city of Jericho. The stones as a memorial that they will not forget what God had done for them when all the people clean passed over Jordan. Everyone passed. The most feeble passed. All the cattle passed. The babies passed. None was left out. Dear friends, why did God ask them to make a memorial? So that they would not forget what God had done for them. When we come to know God and God saved us and the life that is changed, how God made all things beautiful in our lives and how it would bless the people around us the change that takes place. How precious, how wonderful it is, the power of God in bringing, a bond, a, a bringing to us deliverance in our lives. Daily as He guides us, daily as He shows the way before us. And so they were to pick up 12 stones, 12 in the river, and 12, they were to pick it up and hold it with them and bring it so that it will be placed there as a sign, as a memorial, so that they will not forget what God had done for them. Dear friends, do you have signs, memorials? Well, we are going to remember 10 years the Lord has brought us to begin this infant church. 2013, we came here, began with prayer meeting. Well, we began 2012 with a Bible study, weekly Bible study. 2013, we began fortnightly prayer meeting in August. November 17. We began worship here at the worship center. How the Lord has led us. How the Lord has provided a place for us. How do you find a place of worship? And how the Lord led us in the last three years. How wonderful the providence and the provision of God and we must not forget. And so we will remember, we will take account of what God had done for us. What was the purpose? Verse 20, our third thought, declaratively. And those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch 
in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then he shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. What was the purpose of God creating the nation of Israel? It was to be a testimony to the living and true God. What is the reason why God allows us to assemble as a church together? It is for us to remember the mighty hand of God, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. The stones were a witness of the power of the Lord in guiding and leading His people, and it sets them to continually trust Him, to continually trusting the Lord and witness for him that he is the living and true God, that men may come to him in acknowledgement and find salvation. Israel was created by God as his witness to the nations of the world. But we remember when God scattered all the, the people at the Tower of Babel, they were all over the earth. How do you reach people, the nations all over the, all over the world? Well, this, God's plan was through a nation. A nation. And Israel is that nation. With a people, with a constitution, the law that God gave them at Sinai, and now with the land they would become a full-fledged nation. When they cross the Jordan, that's where they would possess their inheritance. How wonderful it is. The reality of Israel possessing the promised land attests to the power of the living God leading and blessing them. May we not forget what God had done for us how He saved us, how He renewed us, how He prospers us. We must not forget. And it must, we must have signs to jot our memory to the goodness of God, the grace of God in our lives, so that we would be a grateful people that the church may be a grateful church for what God had done. You remember when Jesus saved ten lepers? Only one returned, and that one was a Samaritan, was a half-Jew, half-Gentile, outsider, we say. But he returned to give thanks to God because he understood what God had done for him. How great was the grace of God in his life. Dear friends, this is the cardinal virtue for the people of God to continue to prosper in his presence, to give glory to his name, our gratitude, our gratefulness for what God had done. Pray that the Lord would help us to show forth what good things He had done for us by the way we would appreciate Him and the people around us.
Uh, let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Strengthen Thy people to, uh, to behold experientially what Thou has evidently, what Thou has done, and to remember and to give thanks for what Thou has done for us and to declare Thy grace and Thy worth to the world, to those who are still outside the kingdom of God, that they, they too may share this overflowing cup that Thou has filled the blessings that we have received out of thy mercy and thy good hand. Strengthen thy people and help us to praise thee daily with grateful hearts. This I pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.